We're going to do Being Led by the Spirit, Part 2. We'll do a summary from last week on Being Led by the Spirit, Part 1, and then we'll finish up today. Okay? So, point number one. We, we talked about God, God said, I wrote you a letter and gave you clear instructions of what needs to be done. But yet most believers say, I'm not going to do anything until I get a call. You know, they want a special leading. They want the word to be quickened to you. There's all this teaching that I'm not responsible to do anything uh, unless it's quickened to me. Or God calls me and says, hey, go do the thing I already told you to do, which I wrote in my letter. So all that is, is of the devil, which is point number two. Doctrines about needing a special leading or the word must be quickened to me before I will do it or it's not my ministry to lay hands on the sick and you could go on and on all those are doctrines of devils their purpose is to have the believer be relatively if not absolutely inactive in doing good works and that is a work of Satan anything that's hindering you from doing good works it's a doctrine of devils he doesn't want you to do good works and so this whole, that's how these doctrines came about. Then point number three, we looked at what does the Spirit want us to do? And Isaiah 58 does a great job detailing many things like um, get rid of wickedness, sin, crime, violence, and wrongdoing. He wants us to set the oppressed free. The Spirit wants to feed the hungry. He wants to take care of the poor, the naked, and the homeless. The Spirit wants to attend to the needs of the family. He wants us to stop finger pointing, judging and blaming. He wants us to stop malicious, troublesome, wicked, evil speaking. So those are some of the things that the Spirit wants us to do, which are detailed in Isaiah 58. In other words, those are good works that He wants us to do. So we should naturally be inclined to do these things. That's what the Spirit desires. If we're doing those things, in other words, we're being led by the Spirit. We're following the leading of the Spirit when we're doing those things. Point number four. What will happen when you follow the Spirit? It says also in that same chapter, your light will shine, you will be bright, alive, joyful. You will walk in health and, and or receive your healing quickly. God will protect you and guard you. God will answer all of your prayers. The Spirit will constantly lead you. Your needs will be met. You will have strength in your body. You will prosper in life. You will have life and peace. So those are all good things. So when we're following the leading of the Spirit, doing all the things in point number three, then God says He's going to do all these other things for us just naturally, without praying for them, without asking for them. They will just naturally come forth when we're doing the will of God. Okay, point number five, we have this other leading. Our flesh and the devil, they lead us. Our flesh wants to have a party, wants to fight, wants to feel good, wants to play, wants to gossip, worry, be emotional, enjoy wealth. Your flesh wants to be distracted from the Word. You know, you can think of a million other things you'd rather do than go to the hospital and pray for the sick. Okay, and so when you follow the flesh, you will experience condemnation. It says those who walk after the Spirit will not experience condemnation. But if you're walking after the flesh, you will have condemnation. You will feel guilt and shame and other, other feelings like that. Plus, if you're walking after the flesh, you're going to have corruption of the flesh, death, loss of peace, sickness, etc. If you follow the flesh. Also, those who walk according to the flesh cannot please God because you're sowing to Satan when you walk after the flesh. Okay, so the Holy Spirit, he continually leads us to kill the deeds of the flesh. And I believe all that was from Romans chapter 8. Okay, then point number six from last week. If you want to be led by the Spirit, then you simply need to do the words of Jesus. His words are spirit and life. Therefore, if you do His words, then you are being led by the Spirit. So Jesus gave some basic instructions, like Matthew 28 and Mark 16, preach, get people saved and baptized, cast out demons, heal the sick, make disciples, teach Jesus' commands and inspire people to carry out those commands. Okay, so those are the, those are the instructions he gave, gave after he was resurrected. Okay, because both of those happen at the end of the chapter, after he was raised up. Okay, and then point number seven, 
the Holy Spirit lives in you, is upon you, and he abides with you forever. He knows who around you needs help. He guides you with his eye by drawing your attention to people in need. This is a primary and normal way of being led. You need to respond and minister to their needs. Okay, so he's showing you, he's in you, he's, your eyes are drawn to people with needs, just like Tula was drawn to the lady that needed help the other day. Our eyes are drawn to these people. And, and consider that, that's a leading of the Holy Spirit. He said he would guide you with his eyes. Well, he's in you, he's gonna look through your eyes and he's gonna show you where to look. And now you have somebody before you that you have an opportunity to help, that he wants you to help. Okay, then at the same time, concurrently, Satan tries to distract you. You know, he'll try and all of a sudden, if you're at the grocery store and you see somebody with a cane, it's um, all of a sudden the butter is an, is an urgency. I've got to get this butter home. I need to get these eggs home now. I just got to get out of this store. You know, Satan's trying to make your needs seem so urgent that you won't take one minute to minister to the person that's got the cane. That happens just about every time. <laughs> Like he works on me, Bobby, you really need to get back to the house. You don't have time. Don't even, don't even look down the aisle when you're walking. You need to walk with tunnel vision. Don't look down the aisle because then you may see somebody in an electric car and you might, then you're going to have to go talk to them. And if you don't, you're going to feel guilty. So it's better don't even look down the aisle. And I'm telling you real conversations that happen in my head. And that's the devil trying to, he wants you to just walk through the store, looking with your head down so you don't see any targets that need help. So that, you know, anyway, don't listen to that stuff. That's the devil working on you. Okay, he'll try and make you fearful or shy. And the question is, whose leading are you gonna follow? You know, God led you with his eyes to somebody that needs help. Satan's trying to tell you how important it is to get those eggs home right now so you don't have time to talk to them. You know, you, who are you gonna listen to? Okay, um, then point number eight, Holy Spirit may lead you by speaking to you. And that could be giving you a thought or speaking words to you through another person or through TV or radio or something like that. Usually you don't feel led, but rather you look back and see the chain, uh, the chain of events and realize that you were being led. So don't wait on a feeling. Normal leading just feels like normal life, yet it entails stopping to help people you see around you that have need, responding to words you hear in, in everyday life, in everyday conversation. Okay, so just listen. You know, God's leading you. He'll have people speak a conversation in your hearing, so you'll hear things like, oh, my kids are home from school today. Well, he, it's good that he lets you hear that so you know there's somebody that needs help. A lot of things happen like that at work. You know, people will have conversation. Oh, you know, my mom just went in the hospital. Really, you know, that's like an open door. Go, go invite yourself in to go pray for them. Okay, he's letting you hear a need. You know, so-and-so's mom just went to the hospital. You know, you hear, you hear discussion of sickness and medicine and conversation around you in a normal day. And consider each of those, that's a, that's a leading to go do something. You know, you're hearing that for a reason. God will prompt people to talk about a conversation in front of you. You, you, don't, you can't see all this stuff happening, but you just need to know that God is leading you. And so he's, he's guiding your eyes. He's letting you hear things so that you know what needs to be done. Amen? All right, so we'll start on today's teaching then. So we want to be going by default and be told to stop. Be going by default and be told to stop. Most people are waiting to be told to get going, <laughs> okay? As opposed to the other way around. So Acts 16, 4, th 4 through 10. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Tros, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, 
Immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay, so notice that these guys were already busy. You know, at, it says in the first verse there, or verse four actually, as they went through the cities. So they were continually going. They were continually going through cities. They were preaching to them. They were strengthening them. They were leading people in salvation because it says their numbers were increasing daily. So these people, these disciples were not sitting still. They were in action. They were in motion. And they had to have a, a leading to stop and go a different direction. And so the Holy Spirit forbid them from going where they were planning to go. But then they gave Paul a vision. He gave Paul a vision about a need somewhere else. And so the Holy Spirit had a higher priority than what they were already planning to do. Okay, so the key message that we have here is that we need to be, we need to be busy going. You know, we can be going in our daily life. We can be ministering to people at work. We can be ministering to people in the grocery store, wherever we are. You know, there's always an opportunity for us to be sharing the gospel with somebody. But we want to be busy and not be waiting on a leading to get going. Amen? All right, so Daddy. Daddy, we know that you want us busy doing your word. Daddy, in the name of Jesus, let us be filled with all boldness. Let us be filled with fire and passion to do your will. Daddy, let us, let us be free from every fear and timidity that tries to stop us from doing a good work. Daddy, let us be filled with boldness, be filled with zeal to do good works. Daddy, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I want to tell you about a testimony, and I call it the, it's a restless leading, and it's about a guy named Billy that sells newspapers. And um, I didn't know it was a leading until after it was over, which is usually the case. But I was just sitting at my desk at work, and it was about 11 in the morning, and I was just agitated, restless. I just, I got to get up. It's not lunchtime yet, but I just got to go. I, I need to get up from my desk right now. I've just got to go. And I don't know why I was feeling that way, but I was like agitated bad. I just, I had to get up. So I didn't know where I was going, but I just knew how to get out of the office. So I got in my truck and I started driving down 249. And then when I get to 1960 and 249, there was Billy there. And and so I was like, you know, I'm going to give him some. So I reached for my wallet. And when I reached for my wallet, he started walking towards me. And so he had this really bad limp. It was an exaggerated limp. It was bad. And I'm like, hmm. Okay. So he came over and I gave him some money. And he was very gracious and everything. I'm like, hey, you know, what happened to your foot? And he's like, I hurt my, my ankle or my foot a while back. I'm like, well, let me pray for it real quick. And I'm at the red light and it's about to turn green. So it was real fast. I just grabbed his hand. In the name of Jesus, I command pain and, and sickness. You leave his ankle and foot right now. In the name of Jesus, I command this foot to be healed. Walking be restored in Jesus name. And that was all the time that I had time for. And then I said, try it out. And then his face just had shock because it was all gone. He started moving it around and then my light turned green. I'm driving off and I'm looking in the rear view mirror and he's like doing this and <laughs> putting his hand up in the air. And I'm like, yes, yeah. yes. And, and he had asked me, I think for a, a backpack or something. So I went to Academy and got a backpack. And when I came back by uh, to the same intersection, there was another guy. I'm like, hey, do you know where Billy is? He's like, man, I don't, he's, there's something happened to him. He's freaking out. He's running around crying. He was telling me he was on the bus earlier praying for God to heal him. And then some guy pulled up at the red light and prayed for him and his foot is healed. He's crying and stuff. So I made another round and I came back and he was hiding in the bushes and I called him over to the truck and he was just trembling. I mean, it was amazing. I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. And his foot had been injured for, I think it was three years. It'd been a long time he'd been suffering with this. And he was, this was not fake. He was trembling. He was crying. It was awesome. And he was telling everybody. <laughs> it was awesome. And so that was amazing. So in hindsight, that was a leading. He had prayed. God said somebody to answer his prayer. Just like, remember Paul, when he was blind, he was praying. And then he got somebody else prompted to go pray for him. Ananias, right? 
And, and so Ananias got prompted to go pray. Well, he knew what he was going to do. I didn't know what I was going to do. But so Ananias had more information than me. But that, that's how I got led. You know, but I didn't know it, though. So I really enjoyed that. Okay, now we're going to talk about the it seems good feeling. I mean, the, it seems good leading. It seems good leading. Okay, Acts 15, 23 to 29. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Okay, so you notice in verse 25, like they didn't get a word from God about this. There was no word, but they had a feeling. It, it seemed right. It seemed good to us in verse 25. Verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Okay, so they weren't, they didn't get some special word from God. It just, you had, they had a knowing. You know, they had a knowing. And that knowing, um, we should expect that and we should learn to trust in that. Because it says in 1 Corinthians 2.16, it says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? Okay, so that's the way it was in the Old Testament. Nobody had the mind of the Lord. Okay, but in the New Testament, but we have the mind of Christ. Okay, so with the mind of Christ, you have all of his wisdom. You have his heart, his compassion, his love. You have the mind of Christ. Okay, you have the knowledge of Christ. And we just have to learn to discern that knowledge from all the other stuff that's floating around in our head. And 1 John 2.20 says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Okay, so there's a knowing that's within us. And we just have to learn to hone in on that knowing. And it has to be a, a knowing that aligns with Scripture is the key thing. Okay, so if we think we know something, but it doesn't align with Scripture, then we know that that's not God, and we need to work on renewing our mind. But it should be, for, for someone who's mature, that we have been studying the Word, we know what the Word says, we'll have a strong impression or a knowing inside of us, and then if that impression or knowing inside of us aligns with Scripture, then, then we can trust that, and we can act upon that. Amen? And so that's what these guys did here. They just had a knowing. It seemed good to us. It felt right. It aligned with what they knew about, about God, about His will. And so they gave the advice. And it's the same for us. Amen? Amen. Okay, then there's the compassion of the Spirit leading. Romans 5.5 5 tells us, Now hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Okay, so we know that we have the love of God within us and it comes from the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then we want to learn to listen to that because Jesus was led by that. Okay, that love of God that's of the Holy Spirit and that was one of the things that led Jesus as he went around. And we'll look at some examples in Matthew 9, 36 to 38. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Okay, so Jesus was moved with compassion. Just like you can be filled with anger and you could hit somebody. You know, you were moved by the anger. Well, he was, he was moved with compassion. Compassion, that love of God is in us. It's from the Holy Spirit. And Jesus let that lead his actions. 
and in this case, um, lead to prayer. You know, he felt compassion because they were wearied and scattered. They needed a shepherd. They needed a, a pastor or something like that. And so he said, pray. You know, so there should be a leading in us to pray for solutions to come. Okay, in this case, it was praying for more laborers. Okay, so we need to let compassion move us to pray rather than, you know, driving by a group of homeless people and doing nothing. If we can't stop, we can pray for that group of people. Right? So compassion can move us to do something. We can pray for that group of people. Okay? Matthew 14, 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Okay, so most of us lived our whole lives not knowing anything about healing. And we basically, when we were moved with compassion, we would bring soup or a card or pay a visit, which are kind gestures. But now we can let that compassion move us in a more powerful way because we have the Spirit of God. And with the Spirit of God, He breaks all burdens. He sets free. He heals. And so now we can let that compassion come more alive because we can be more helpful than what we could before. Amen? Amen. Okay, so Jesus saw sick people. He was moved with compassion and He healed their sick. So we just need to know that we have been equipped we have been given the Holy Spirit for the purpose of setting people free. That's one of the primary purposes, to break the yoke, destroy the burden. Amen? All right, then Matthew 15, 32 to 38. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Now those who ate were 4,000 men besides the women and children. Okay, so Jesus was moved with compassion and he fed the hungry. Okay, then in Mark 5, 18 and 19, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Okay, so compassion led him to uh, set the, the demoniac free, uh, legion. Okay, so he was moved with compassion for legion and he set him free. Then Luke 7, 13 to 14. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Okay, so here he raised the dead out of compassion for the living mother. Okay, so these are leadings that Jesus had. The Holy Spirit was leading him. He was filled with the love and compassion of God. And that led him to do all these different things. And we need to be moved by that same compassion to do something. We have more power and capability to help people than, than we've ever appreciated or ever realized. And so we need to just start believing that just like Jesus was equipped with power and with the spirit and with authority to help these people, we have that exact same equipping. And you know, we're born again. We're born by the spirit of God. We're anointed with the Holy Spirit. All the same power that Jesus had, we also have. And we need to just start walking in that more and more. And then as we do, it grows and we'll, more profound things we'll be able to do. Amen. And we have to be careful too, like there, there are times like I go to the grocery store and I do the tunnel vision, I'm not gonna look at anybody thing because I'm, you know, I'm in a bad mood or whatever other excuse I might have. And if I do that too much, it hardens your heart and you start being not compassionate. You know, I have to be careful that I don't walk past too many people and I hardened my heart and I hardened my heart. And then pretty soon I'm back to where I was before I learned anything where I don't think I can do anything. So I don't even pay attention to sick people. So don't let your heart be hardened by not doing good works that are before you. The more you do it, the softer your heart's going to become and the more willing you're going to be to do good works. You know, you kind of have to get it started. Amen. Can I 
the way for Star to step up and do what you teach us to do is the most extremely hard to do. One is the devil, the you know, you're not you know, we're not, you're not a member of us, you know. The other is the flesh. The flesh tells you, you're not going by. You're not there yet. You're going to mess up. You're going to. And it's as we do more and more and more and more, the freedom will come. The victory is ours. And pretty soon you don't even think the negative that the flesh will come. This is for all of us. All of us. I, I know this. I have been through <coughs> 10 years ago in that. And it's easy for me to break in a conversation. Much harder is for John than it is for me. Much harder. He break in. But it was not so to begin with. And I still have that hesitation. Yeah, but it's much easier now that it's you're moving. Easier. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. More will be used and more will become. Uh, not used to exactly, but more free. Mm -hmm. More free for us. I don't know the rest of you have that experience. Mm -hmm. That's true for me, I'm sure for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I just try and break that thing. Like I went to Walmart, I think it was yesterday, and I had that feeling like I don't want to look at anybody. I'm like, the, the first person I didn't want to see, I went straight up to them and talked to them. Because I got to kill that thing. Because that's the devil. He tries to put that discouragement on me every time I go in the store. And, and I, you know, I'll be feeling all grumpy and everything. And I'll walk straight up to the first person. I'll do it anyway. And then I feel free. And then it's easier. So we just have to blast through that. It's just the devil. And I think it's on one of the following pages. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Commonly, we talk about commanding the devil as far as resisting. But there's also resisting by not biting on his temptation to not do a good work or not biting on his temptation to do a bad thing. It, it, you know, it can be either. But when we resist him by not doing his will, but instead submitting to God and doing his will, despite the grumpy feelings or whatever weird feelings we may have, then we're also resisting Satan because we're not bowing to his temptation. And then that, that barrier gets lower and lower and lower like what you've experienced. Yeah. Amen? Okay, special leading of Jesus for temptation. Okay, this is a leading we will not have. God's not going to lead us into temptation. Um, Jesus had a special assignment. So Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Okay, then also in Luke 4.14, 4, it adds to that, and it says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. So that's an interesting point there. All right, so let's just read through these points here. So point number two. Notice that Satan is the tempter, not God. God will never tempt us. He cannot tempt us. He will not lead us into temptation. Jesus had a special assignment. We're going to look at that in a second here. Okay, number three. In this case, Holy Spirit led Jesus to be tempted by the devil. This is not a leading you will ever have. Jesus had to suffer all the same things that we suffer in order that he overcome them, that he is able to relate to us and that he is able to help us having suffered in the same way. 
Everything that Jesus suffered is something that we can have victory over. Okay, so Jesus suffered something to set us free from something. That's how the whole gospel works. He, he suffered sickness, we can be free from sickness. He suffered pain, we can be free from pain. He took stripes that we can have healing. He was punished that we can have peace. He suffered shame that we don't have to be put to shame. And on and on. He suffered hunger right here in this temptation. He suffered hunger so we shall not be hungry. He suffered poverty so we shall not be poor. And so he suffered every temptation and trouble of man he suffered to set us free from those. So Jesus had a special assignment he had to go through so that he could be the perfect high priest, so that he could help us in these situations. All right, and then point number four, Jesus rejected Satan's temptations by quoting a scripture he was believing um, versus what Satan had, had said to him. Let me say that again. Jesus was rejecting what Satan's temptations by quoting a verse that he was believing in. You know, notice he said like three different times, it is written, it is written. So when Satan comes to you with a dumb thought, like Bobby, you're not gonna go, you're not gonna go down that aisle and pray for that sick person. They're not gonna get healed anyway. When he says that to me, I need to be like, away with you Satan, for it is written, me, a believer, will lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. Okay, so that's, that's the whole principle of taking every thought captive, casting it down, casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So when Satan whispers in your ear something like that, something about failure or not doing a good work or doing a bad thing, you cast that thing down. I reject this in the name of Jesus for it is written and then quote the scripture that you're believing in. That's how Jesus dealt with temptation. So I think we should learn from that and apply the same principle. Okay? Is it also the fact that you know who you are? Jesus knew who he was and never was able to be attempted. He knew. But so do we. The, the more uh, educated we become on the scriptures, the more we know who we are, the born of the flesh, but we're born from the spirit, and it's the way the sons of God we live then this is easier for us just like Jesus did. You know, he's the, he's the power that left us, but we also stand in other very truth and not confuse, not take it. It's lies. Notice, you're exactly right. Notice what he, twice he said, if you are the son of God, if you have authority, if you think you're anointed, if so he's going to try and make us question our identity and get us doubting who we are we, we've been made just like jesus he brought this temptation to jesus i mean he's certainly bringing that same doubting thought if you're a son of god if you know he always wants us to question who we are yeah because it, all of us he can point our past he can point sin in our lives but if you know that you are a team, you are set aside for the Lord of God. You are justified. You are a child of God. And you know this, then he has nothing to come against you because you are in the Lord of God. Amen. This is important. What I want to understand is stronger, stronger, stronger. Amen. Okay. All right, let's go to point number five. So Satan quoted Psalm 91, which reminds us that we are protected in every way. No evil will befall us. I, I'm confessing pieces of Psalm 91 almost every day, because if you can believe Psalm 91, you have nothing to fear. No evil is going to befall you. No sickness is going to get you. No violence is going to get you. No war is going to get you. You'll be delivered from every trouble. You'll be kept safe. All your prayers will be answered. You'll live a long life. You'll have salvation. Psalm 91 just rocks. Okay, so um, that's just a side note. <laughs> it's a good one to believe. But notice, Satan was trying to tempt Jesus to test the scripture that God would protect him. And so we're not to tempt God. Jesus responded. He says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And so we're going to use that verse again in a minute. But Jesus said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So just keep that one in mind. Okay, then as a side note, notice that Satan, not God, had authority over all the kingdoms of the earth. 
I don't know that we ever really laid hold of the gravity of what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. But when they sinned, they, they, man was given the earth. Man was given dominion over the earth. We were the, intended to be the gods of the world, the rulers of the world. And when they bowed the knee to Satan, a catastrophe happened much more than we've imagined. They made Satan God of the world. Jesus said it three times, the ruler of this world is coming. The ruler of this, God, if, if the ruler of the world is coming, who was not ruling the world? God was not ruling the world. Jesus brought the kingdom of God, which is the rule and reign of God. God wasn't ruling all that time before Jesus. And we had never have quite laid hold of that, but we need to kind of realize the gravity of what it was. God is only ruling in this world to the extent that there are born again believers operating in the kingdom, operating in authority. That's the only degree to which God is actually ruling the world today. And so we need to multiply that dramatically. Amen? The way I see that, and I often understand that I think, and that is before Jesus was born, full God and full man, there was no one who was able to take the dominion back from the, the devil. No one was able to. But Jesus, who born from a, from a woman, who born a human being, who was full, full human being, he had the dominion over the earth that none of us could have before that. And so he lived as a tall man, the kind of tall man, and when the devil thought he killed the, the, the uh, provision, he killed the, the one who was able. And as he said, the tetelus, I told that it was woman today. The word that the tetelus, that is finished, it's finished, it's what we finish once and for all. Pay for our sins, yes, but take the dominion. So it's almost like telling the devil, pay to the kiss over. I am here. You have nothing in me. Innocent blood. You take innocent blood, it's like you take innocent blood, the, the searches of uh, Adam, handle the his back, and he deliver us once and for all. And that very dominion, that very authority, that very power, he's given to us, all authority, that to this woman today, all authority in heaven and earth has given to me, Jesus said. Go therefore, but is the believers are taking that authority. And as long as that I was sitting in the church all these years, no, no power, no understanding, no teaching, no nothing. So I suffer physically, people suffer and die. Yeah, and I have no idea that the authority given back to, to us, to the believers. He, he who believe and be baptized, this authority is given. Yeah. Oh, man, it's a big thing. Amen. Amen. It's amazing. When you wake up to authority, life changes all of a sudden. You dominate. Instead of being dominated by the devil, you dominate him. Life changes. Work changes. Work, it'll, it'll try to get out of control on me, and I'll just come against it. Chaos, stress, all that's from the devil. Busyness. Problems at work. That's the devil. I just command that stuff. Get out of my job in the name of Jesus. And now it's almost boring at work. So I, <laughs> so I need to, you know, do some other things. But, but you have authority in every aspect of life. And it's just amazing when we start putting that into practice. Okay, number seven. After having victory over all the temptations, Satan left him. Refusing to bite on temptation causes Satan to leave. Additionally, after all this temptation, angels ministered to Jesus. Presumably they were strengthening him and encouraging him, doing things like that. Okay, but you know, there's more than one way to resist the devil. Not bowing down to him is resisting the devil. Not, not succumbing to his temptation is resisting the devil. Okay, we also can command him. That's another way of resisting the devil. Okay, so point number eight. Luke adds that he was operating in the power of the Spirit after overcoming all those temptations. Now, I think that was put in there for a reason. Okay, 
Perhaps there's something about overcoming temptation that will help us operate in power. We, if we're overcoming temptation, we're more submitted to the will of God than we are to Satan's will and to our flesh's will. Okay, so it doesn't say that, that um, th the power was dependent upon overcoming the temptations, but it's there for a reason. So I think there's a linkage there. I'm not going to say it's a doctrine, but I, I bet that there's some linkage that if you're overcoming temptation, not succumbing to those temptations, then I think you're going to be more submitted to God and you'll more than likely be operating more freely in power. Uh, Luke 4.14, yeah. Okay. And then Hebrews 2.10 to 18. For This tells us why Jesus had to go through the temptations. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Okay, so Jesus suffered temptation. Okay, so notice that is one of the sufferings we'll have as Christians. Um, we have sufferings of persecution. We may have sufferings of hardship doing the will of God. And we may have this, the suffering of not bowing down to temptation because it says right here that it was a suffering for Jesus to make it through those temptations. So it wasn't necessarily a piece of cake. Okay, but now he's able to help those who are being tempted because he went through all this. Okay, so he's the captain of our, of our salvation. He was made perfect by suffering all the same things that we had to suffer, that we suffer. So that's why it's a special leading for Jesus to be led to suffer those things, but not something that God would ever lead us into. Okay, and then James 4, 7 to 8 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so Jesus exemplified submitting to the will of God, resisting the devil by not doing his will by not doing the temptation and he also resisted the devil by commanding him away with you satan that was the final thing that sent him away for good and then if, if you want to draw near to god i just put in that next verse just because it's good um, cleanse your hands purify your heart and you know, if you get out of sin if you wash your hands of sin purify your heart you will draw near to god and he will draw near to you Okay, so let's go to point number 12. So application. With respect to being led to do the word, such as healing, Satan will tempt you to back out rather than pray. The more you resist this by doing, the easier it becomes because he knows you will do God's will. Okay, so for example, he'll try and cause something to happen to make you back out of praying for somebody. So I was at Kindred Hospital yesterday and there was a man with a walker in the elevator. And I, I, you know, I asked him if I could pray for him. And I knew we were going to get interrupted. It's an elevator. <laughs> so I'm praying for him in the elevator. The elevator's going up. The door opens. There's a man standing there watching me pray for him. He lets the elevator close. We go back down. It comes back up. The door opens. The man, the same man is there. But, um, you know, I didn't back out. It was so, it would have been so easy to stop and be timid because the door just opened and I'm blocking somebody from getting in the elevator because I'm laying hands on this guy. We're blocking the door, but um, it all worked out good, right? So I didn't back out on the temptation to stop praying because it was weird and awkward. I just, I just lean my head down and just do what I need to do. You know, I try not to look at all the things that are going on around me because then you, you are more likely to be timid. So just lean in, close your eyes, whatever you need to do, just focus on what you're doing. Don't, don't be distracted. The guy was patient, you know. <laughs> he didn't say anything. He didn't interrupt us. He got in the elevator the second time, <laughs> came down with us. Okay, so don't back down. And Satan, he will try to get you to back down. There was a lady I went to go visit at a nursing home named uh, Bobby. And I was visiting with her, prayed for her. And then we were getting ready to pray for her son who had lung cancer. And then as soon as we start to pray, 
a nurse comes in, starts talking to the lady in the bed next to us. They start getting loud. I get louder. They get louder. I get louder. They get louder. And so finally, I was just like roaring in the name of Jesus. Cancer, you get out of his body. And I just, I just had to just tune them out. I'm like, this is a devil. And this is a, he's trying to compete with me. No. Like before I would have backed down. You know, like I'd be in a room and, and a doctor would come in and I would just kind of shy away or family members would come in and I would shy away. The, the more you bow down to that temptation to stop, then Satan's going to keep bringing that because it works. Okay, but when you stop bowing down to that and you start pushing through anyway, he realizes that doesn't work anymore and he's going to try that less often on you. That's good. Okay, so don't bow down to the easy temptation to stop. Because he won't try and make it weird, awkward, timid, fearful. He'll try and bring people in the room. People walk up down the aisle in the grocery store. Just lean your head in and, and focus. Amen? Amen? Okay, the next section. God does not lead us into temptation. James 1, 13 to 15 is very clear. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Okay, so I just want to add, there are two sources of temptation. Ourself, our desires of our flesh, and also Satan, who is also called the tempter. Okay, so you can, you can tempt yourself and Satan can also contribute to that and bring you temptation. But it's crystal clear let no one say, do not say I am tempted by God. And, and really when you look at that Greek word, it's tempted, tested, tried, and disciplined. So it includes all of that. Okay, so that word there means more than just tempted. It says, let no one say when I am in a trial. Let no one say when I believe I'm being disciplined. Let no one say when I'm being tested. All those words are the definition of that Greek word periazo. And I probably didn't say it right, but yeah. pirazo. Okay, so that word means more than just tempt. So when somebody's in a trial, do not say you're in that trial because of God. When you're being tested, do not say you're being tested because of God. When you are experiencing what you perceive to be discipline, do not say I'm being disciplined by God. Let no one say. He doesn't do those things. Amen? It's crystal clear. Crystal clear. Luke 4.12 And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God. Okay, now, anything that God commands us to do, then we also know that is something that He, whatever He commands us not to do, is something He also will not do. Because you can't tell your kid, don't do something, and then you do it yourself, because then you're a hypocrite. Okay, and Jesus spoke a lot about hypocrites, right? So any command that God gave us, like you shall not tempt God, that means that God cannot tempt us. If we can't tempt him, he can't tempt us. He would be a hypocrite, right? So you can apply that hypocrisy um, uh, thinking to a lot of things in the Bible and, and, and you'll see more truth in that way. Okay, so we know from James 1.13 that it's true that God cannot tempt us. We also know from taking the hypocrite aspect, he commanded us not to tempt the Lord, our God. Therefore, he will not tempt us either. He would be a hypocrite. Okay. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So God doesn't lead us into a temptation. He gives us an exit from the temptation. Every temptation has an exit door. We just need to, to find that. We need to take it. A lot of times we don't want to take it, but we need to take it. God doesn't put us in a temptation. He gives you the exit. Amen? Proverbs 4, 10 to 12. Hear my son and receive my sayings and the years of your life will be many. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered 
And when you run, you will not stumble. Okay, so God is clear. He, uh, first of all, he speaks to us. You know, he's given us the, the word. He gives us thoughts and other words from through people and whatever, uh, other ways. Okay, but he speaks to us. Mostly the Bible is, is where we get the sayings of God. Okay, when we walk in that way, according to the word of God, the years of our life will be many. We will live a long life. Okay, he gives us wisdom. Okay, notice it says, I have led you in right paths. He doesn't lead you into temptation. He leads you on right paths, away from it. He does not lead us into temptation. I have led you in right paths. When you walk, you will not be hindered. You will not stumble. Okay, so he's not leading us into a trap. He's not leading us into a test or a temptation. Psalm 23, 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Okay, so when you look at the word, he leads me in paths of righteousness, right paths, ethically right paths, not sinful temptation paths, but right paths. He's going to lead you in a good way. You know, he gives us wisdom and sends us in a good direction. No parent wants to, you know, send their kid and down the wrong path, right? And so God does not tempt us, nor does he lead us into temptation. He leads us onto right paths, path of righteousness. He pro provides a way out of every temptation. So there is always, there is always a means of victory. Amen? Okay, now sometimes it helps to see things by making a silly story. Okay, so we're going to make a mockery of tempting our children. Yesterday, you and your wife just taught your son Billy Bob that he shouldn't drink, nor should he be involved in premarital sex. You discuss things and decide that you should test his morals by putting him into a tempting situation contrary to what you just taught him. Father decides to go to a house of sin and hires a beautiful young temptress to cross paths with Billy Bob this weekend. Her mission is to tempt him to drink and see where that leads to. If your teaching really sunk in, you are confident that Billy Bob will shun the temptation and all will be well. If the teaching did not sink in, perhaps he gets drunk and crashes the car, injuring or killing himself or others. Perhaps he becomes a father at a young age. Maybe he gets a disease of some kind, and you could go on and on. And now, would you ever do such a thing to your kid? Nobody would ever bring a temptation upon their kid to potentially cause them to fail and suffer terrible consequences. I mean, that's just ridiculous sounding when you put a story around it. But people think that God leads people into temptation. They think he leads them into a trial. He's not doing that. I mean, nobody's going to set their kid up for failure. You know, if they pass this test, he's going to live and be stronger. But if he fails, him and some other people might be dead. That's just ridiculous. Okay, so we have the scripture, but then you can also see when you mock it up into a, a real life story, it just doesn't make sense. Amen? So, Daddy, we thank you that you do not lead us into temptation. Daddy, in the name of Jesus, let us be protected from all temptation. Let us be protected from temptations of our flesh. Let us be protected from temptations of the devil. Daddy, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so the conclusion of all this is we want to be busy about our Father's business. Okay, Luke 2.49. And he said to them, Why do you seek me? Do you not know that I must be about my Father's business? Okay, so that's, we need that to be our motto. We need to be about our Father's business. We need to increase in our Father's business. Luke 12, 42 to 44. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. Okay, so if we want to be a faithful and wise steward, we need to be doing. We need to be doing our father's business. Okay, blessed is the servant that is doing. And his master will bless him. Okay, if we want to be that blessed servant, that faithful and wise steward, then we need to be busy doing. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man 
who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Okay, so we want to be doing the sayings of Jesus. We will be a wise man. He who does the sayings of Jesus is a wise man. When we're doing the words of Jesus, his words are spirit and life. So if we're doing his words, we're being led by the spirit. And you know, we're not waiting on a phone call from God. We're doing the words Jesus already spoke. And that's what we need to be doing by default. And those people who do not do those, trouble will come and they will not prevail through trouble. They will have a great fall. Okay, so we want to be busy doing our daddy's business. Okay, so point number four, let's get busy doing good works, being led by what we see, by what we hear, being led by compassion, not waiting on special leadings to get moving. We need to be moving and, and require a special leading to go a different direction. You know, that's the kind of leading we need to get. Bobby, I need you to go over here instead of going over there today. And that would be the kind of leading we need other than, Bobby, get up off the couch. Come on, get up, go, get up off the couch. Quit watching football. You know, we don't want that leading. We need to be going, be doing. Okay, and then number five, if we want to just hone this in on some specific things, we want to get active doing the works outlined in Isaiah 58, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Mark 16, 15 to 18. So basically that's, you know, helping people, the hungry, the poor, the naked. It's um, stop blaming, pointing, judging. It's setting people free from oppression, you know, laying hands on the sick, casting out demons, um, and on and on. So you can go back and read those. Amen? Amen. All right, are there any questions about what we went over? Are you motivated? Okay. We all ought to like have have like make a goal for yourself for this week. I'm gonna do something incremental to what I normally do this week. Maybe I'll go to the hospital, maybe I'll go feed some homeless people, but do something. Add add something to what you normally do this week. And let's just start making a practice of that. Amen?